Um, thanks so much. Um, so a couple of things I want to just emphasize up front. One, this is meant to be helpful for all of you. So as you have questions, um, I know there's like a set question time later. If you want to wait, that's fine. But if you want to ask questions as I'm going, that's totally cool. Also, I may not see a hand up. So if you could just like scream out um, and I'm happy to address questions. Um, the other thing I want to emphasize is this is anything I say today, like you should take with a grain of salt. It's only based on my own account. Um, everyone has slightly different viewpoints and different experiences. And um, if I know that I'm departing in a way from how some other people think about things, I'll try to highlight it. Um, but, um, but, you know, it, this is only based on my own account here. Um, so Gabrielle says, sort of told you a little bit about where I was coming from. So I'm gonna just skip over that in, in the interest of time. And um, I'll tell you sort of the roadmap I have planned um, in terms of what to talk about today. So first I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the economic journal. Um, I'll talk about what influences editorial decisions at a big picture level. Um, then I'll talk a little bit or more so about preparing a paper for submission. Um, then we'll talk about how to think about where to submit your paper, how to think about how to submit your paper, and then what happens at the journal after you, um, you've submitted, and then what happens um, once you hear back with a decision from the journal. Okay. So with that said, um, let me begin with telling you about the economic journal. Um, so the economic journal is viewed as a general interest journal. So we're going to be thinking about publishing things that might be interesting to a broad set of economists, not just, um, you know, economists in a very, very specific narrow subfield. Um, the, um, the journal is going has a structure of having an editor in chief plus eight managing editors. Um, in addition, we have a team of associate editors. Mostly the associate editors are going to be, um, you know, acting as referees for papers, but sometimes they'll do more. So sometimes, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about desk projects. Sometimes we rely on associate editors for advice there. Sometimes we rely on um, associate editors for advice on who to ask for referees, things like that. Um, in addition, there's a data editor who, after the paper has accepted, does some replication checks um, to make sure that all your code is correct and that it's generating the results that you say it's been generating. Okay. Um, in terms of submissions, um, we get quite a lot of submissions. So in 2021, we got um, 1,929 submissions of which 1,633 were new submissions, and 236 of them were short papers. We do, it's a lot of papers to go through, um, right? You can't read, even with nine of us on the board, we can't read um, 1,929 papers very carefully, um, right? So we're going to have to make some tough calls. And so we do a fair number of desk rejections. And as you'll see, more than half the new submissions um, get desk rejected. Um, at the same time, our acceptances in 2021 were 104. Um, the turnaround time is actually quite good. Um, so the turnaround time is about 34 days. Now, admittedly, that takes into account also the desk rejections that happen fairly quickly. Um, if you're not desk rejected, then the turnaround time is on average 69 days. Um, most of the, you know, most of the hang up in terms of getting a decision to you comes in terms of waiting for referee reports. Um, we have 93% of our referee reports return, uh, of our referees return reports within three months. And most of our decisions um, happen within two to four months. Um, now, I was looking sort of at the outliers and like the outliers, we had a couple of, of decisions happening in five months, but what was very striking to me is that there was no decision that took six months or more. Um, this is very striking to me because when I was a junior, um, 
there was essentially no journal I could go to where I could be guaranteed a decision by six months. Um, it was, you know, I, I would send out my papers and fingers crossed I'd hear in 11 months um, whether I got a revise and resubmit or whether the referees made a stupid mistake and, you know, and misread my paper and now I had to try a new journal, um, you know. And so, you know, and so the fact that we're, we're getting this quick turnaround time, I think, is quite good for junior. Okay. Um, finally, let me say the submission fee is a hundred pounds. Um, plus, you have to have a membership; otherwise, it's more money. Um, and then there are, of course, discounted membership rates for students and things like that, which I cannot tell you to be honest um, off the top of my head. Um, so that's a little bit about the economics journal, uh, the economic journal. Let me um, go to what influences journal decisions. Okay, so here I'm thinking, you know, both from my experience at EJ, but also my experience broader. Um, so what are editors trying to maximize? Okay, so one is they definitely want, you know, to have to be publishing papers that have a big impact. Um, you know, I just get a good feeling when I was like, oh yeah, I picked that paper out and look, people now really like it. Um, they're also thinking about the impact of the journal. Um, this is sort of more so, I would say, at journals like EJ, where you have um, like a group of managing editors making decisions. Um, at a journal like JET, where you have the associate editors making decisions, I think the associate editors probably care a little bit less about the impact of the journal versus the impact of the actual papers they're pu publishing. Um, you want to think about promoting new, interesting, important research. So, you know, so things that get people excited. Um, and then sometimes editors promote their own research agenda. Um, and here I sort of like, you know, I, 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 this is a place probably where I depart a little bit from other um, editors. So I actually think like, you shouldn't be promoting your own research agenda. You, like to have a really good journal, you should be promoting good research. And if you're promoting your, your agenda, sometimes you're, um, you're taking a paper that, that might not be as good. Um, so, but, but it is the case that sometimes journal um, editors promote their own research agenda, and that might influence where you send your paper, because if there's a, um, if, it, and, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, so the constraints that editors have is one is there's a limited time, right? I mean, there, there's only a certain number of hours in the day. Um, I need to read the papers associated with the, you know, journal. I need to do my teaching. I need to do my own research. I need to do with, deal with the admin in my department, right? Um, the, there's just so much time I can spend on this. So, I, you know, it's going to be um, that editors are just doing their best given the limited time. The, there's also a limited number of articles you can accept, right? So, you know, there's there's only, you know, about 100 articles published a year, right? And so you can't all of a sudden go and accept every article you you read, even if you love it, because you've, you know, there's just not enough space in the actual journal. And this sort of comes to the, the other comment that you sometimes hear, and I think is, you know, has become a constraint in certain journals where, um, they talk about limited space in terms of limited number of pages. Um, I think this is, you know, in my view, this is a little bit sort of off in the sense of, um, you know, what a lot of journals are trying to do when they, they constrain space is they're really trying to force authors to either write a paper clearly and so to think about what goes into the paper and how well focused the paper is. And they're also trying to, you know, prohibit you know, 50 million extensions of the pay, of, of a model um, so that the paper doesn't become overblown. And that's because then the paper is not focused. And that's something we'll come back to and talk about a little bit later. Um, so I think like, you know, a lot, I personally, you know, if your paper is 40 pages or 60 pages, I don't particularly care so long as it's actually a very clear paper. But this has turned into a constraint at lots of journals. Um, 
And in particular, there's some journals that just won't even allow you to submit a paper that's more than 40 pages with certain type settings. Okay. okay, so why do you why should you care about you know what the editors are maximizing and what are the constraints? Well, you care about them if they're to the extent that they're actionable on your your part, right? So if you think about an editor who's trying to promote a new and interesting research um, 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 program or, or research in general, right? You want to be very clear and tell tell them in the introduction up front why is this question important? Why is this interesting? Right? If you think about um, about um, editors who are trying to Im um, increase the impact, well, you got to tell them why your paper is going to influence other papers in the literature, and you've got to be explicitly telling them about that up front in your introduction. And if you think about things like limited time, what you want to do is you want to write your paper so that it's incredibly readable. So you want to increase the readability of your paper. And this is something that I think lots of um, people don't really recognize, you know, often sort of gloss over and don't really think through, like, is my paper readable to anyone other than myself? Um, and maybe they also think like, but it's not about the research. It's just about the presentation. Right, but if it's if the editor does if the editor and the referees don't understand why your paper is so great because it's difficult to read, then you know it hasn't really helped you, right? Um, they're they're trying to make the best best decisions, but under this um, time constraint that needs to be taken seriously. Okay, so. When you think about preparing the paper for submission, there are, there are I think three questions you wanna be talking to yourself or asking yourself and thinking through. So what is the contribution? Is my paper well-focused? And is it clear and well-organized? Okay, so, um, so what's the contribution? So here you wanna ask yourself, you know, what does someone who knows the literature learn that they didn't know before they read my paper? If a specialist read my paper, would the specialist say, ah, it's obvious? Or would the specialist say, oh, no, I didn't know that? Is this paper going to be essentially replicating another paper with a minor twist or two? Or is it asking something novel above what the other papers are asking? And also, is this results, are these results important to other fields? Or are they really only specific to the fields that you're talking? Now, of course, you know, when we all write our, our papers, we know our papers are the best, right? We're interested in them. So by definition, everyone should be interested in them. And, you know, but we're all a little bit self-biased in that way, right? And so, you know, it's important, I think, here to try to solicit other people's opinions on these questions um, to get a, a good sense of this, because that's going to affect how you pitch the paper in terms of your writing and also where you think about sending the paper at the end of the day. So going to conferences and, you know, getting some co-authors and trying to, you know, get your co-authors to give you truthful advice on, on, on the papers that are not with them, right? I think that's all, you know, super important to get an, a non-biased assessment of these questions. And then once you have, um, you have a good sense of this, what you want to do is you want to write the introduction to make the contribution clear up front to the reader okay and here you want to be careful you want to take credit so you definitely don't want to say you know i did an okay thing here you know like if you did something good tell the tell the reader that you did something good but you don't want to overstep right so if you tell the reader you know i invented the world i invented sliced bread and the reader's like i've been eating sliced bread for the last 15 years like or 30 years or you know so you can you don't want to take too much credit so it's it's a fine line here um but you definitely want to make your your contribution clear up front okay. the second question you want to ask yourself is is your paper focused and here you want to be rewriting reading your blah, you want to be writing your paper to ensure that it's focused okay and by this i mean what you don't want to do is you don't want to do too many things at the same time. You don't want 50 million extensions in your paper, right? Some people think that, hey, I need to put every extension in because maybe a referee asks about that extension. But ultimately that often leads to 
a non-focused paper that becomes hard to read and more difficult to see your contribution. So here you want to make sure you don't write everything you know about the subject. Instead, what you want to do is you want to make sure the paper tells a story. Okay, so here's the here's the the important question I'm asking. Okay, and here's why my results, my setup of the paper, my my empirical results, my theoretical results fit. You know, address the question that I'm I'm trying to answer. And here's here's the mechanism that leads. To, 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 the, to these results, right? So you want a logical structure to the entire paper and one that really just tells the story of why, why uh, of, of, of what the paper is about. If a, if a result can't, if you can't tell the reader why they should be interested in the result relative to your story, you need to step back and say, does it belong in the paper? I don't wanna say the answer to that is always no. Sometimes it's sufficiently interesting that you say, Hey, by the way, you know, this is not part of the story of this paper, but you might want to notice this. It's very interesting. But for the most part, you want to make sure that all the results that you have and all the setup is going to fit into the story of the paper. The third question is, um, is this paper clear and well organized? And this is really a question about readability. Um, so when I teach a second year PhD class, I always um, um, put on the syllabus uh, that they have to read the Zen of Python. Um, and we won't go into all the um, all of the Zen of Python today, but I encourage you to go back to the Zen of Python after this, because it really is a beautiful thing, not only about how to write code, but how to write academic papers, um, with potentially the, ex the exception of namespaces are one hunking great idea. I'm not sure that that has anything to do with um, academic papers, but but for the most part, it is. And let me sort of, in the interest of time, just talk about a couple of these, um, a couple of, of, of principles here. Okay, so one principle is explicit is better than implicit. So here we've been talking about some things already, like you want to state your contribution loudly and clearly, and you want to do this up front um, and in the main text of the paper. Okay, in the in, sorry, up front in the introduction and then throughout the main text of the paper. Okay. Also, if you know that your referees are likely to be confused about something, so for instance, there's something else happening in the literature, and your referees are going to think that that thing in the literature answers the question you're talking about. Now, you know it doesn't. You know it's silly to even think that because you've thought really hard about that. But if you don't, you know, address that confusion, then the referees are just going to be confused about it and they're going to come back and they're going to say, but don't we already know this, right? So it's better if you explicitly address any confusion. You don't have to be mean about it. You don't have to say, oh, that literature sucks. You could, you could say, look, that literature is doing the X, I'm doing Y, right? And you just make that clear to the, to, to the reader why X and Y are very different um, exercises. The second is something, again, we've already touched on, which is readability counts. Okay, so, one, so there are a bunch of things I said before you should um, work on increasing readability, and there are a bunch of things you can do to try to increase readability. So one is that you want to let the reader know throughout the paper where you're going. So begin, say, every section with a couple of sentences saying, this section is going to do X, Y, and Z, and then go ahead and do it. But just, you know, give the reader a sense of where you're going. Also, use language that is readily understandable by any economist, not just the specialist. So this is sometimes some, you know, um, sometimes that, you know, something that one sees, particularly in papers that young people write, they, they assume everyone knows everything. Um, and they assume everyone knows all the lingo in the literature and things like that. Um, but, you know, but remember, not everyone does it. And, you sometimes just adding in a couple of lines of English explaining, you know, the concept the first time you're doing it is going to be helpful and it's going to increase um, readability. Okay. Also, don't write overly complex sentences. You know, sometimes I read papers where people have sentences that have like 60, 80 words in your sentence. Um, it's, it's it's a really difficult sentence to understand when you're reading through a sentence that has 80 words in a sentence. And 
I see this pretty freaking often. Um, if you, I try to personally write overly short sentences. Um, maybe not overly. I personally try to write short sentences because I think it gives you e ideas that are easier to digest. It also, um, when you write long sentences, sometimes the quant what you're trying to quantify in the sentence becomes confused and the quantifiers get confused and people misunderstand what you're saying. And short sentences, it's easier to place the quantifiers in exactly the right spot. Okay. Also, think about using consistent notation and, ter um, and consistent terminology. So you don't want to, for instance, um, change notation halfway through the paper. Likewise, you don't want to um, you don't want to be calling first your players players, and then you call your players agents, and then you call them people. You want you know one term to refer to the same thing throughout the paper. Um, and when I say, and, and I should have added here, I wrote consistent notation, but more so I think notation that lets the reader say remember what it is, right? So if um, so, if if there's standard notation for say an information set in the literature, you want to use that standard notation. If it's if if you're making up notation for a new concept that you've called, I don't know, portability, you might say, well, portability starts with a P. So maybe I use either a P to indicate portability, or maybe I use a, a pi to indicate it, but something that's going to remind the reader of what the concept is. Finally, um, beautiful is um, better than ugly. Oh, so here, I said, I said this already. Choose notation that's reminiscent of what you're trying to capture. That should have gone under beautiful is better than ugly. Um, but also, tables and figures should be easy to understand. Um, and then also, you want to do, you want to proofread many, many times. As many times as you think you need to proofread, you probably need to proofread it like 10 more times than that. Um, we all make mistakes. I, when I proofread, I try to actually read my paper out loud um, because it's, it often helps me catch something that I wouldn't catch, including it, uh, it makes me realize when things are not good in terms of readability. Um, so, so that's sort of a nice trick um, that I've also forced my students um, sometimes to do. Okay, now let's talk about where to submit. Um, I know I'm getting sort of short on time, but we'll get here through this. Uh, so when you think about where to submit, you're going to think about, you want to think about, do I want to submit to a general interest journal or a field journal? And even within general interest journals, there's the so-called top five. So AER, Econometrica, ooh, there I have a typo, JP, QJE, and Restud versus second tier general interest journals like, you know, EJ or um, AJ Micro or Restat or things like that, okay? Um, when you think about the distinction between a field journal versus a general interest journal, you want to think about, um, is, this a, um, is this a paper that's going to, you know, use a known method to address new data or a new situation? versus is this a paper that's going to apply, that's going to give me a method that I might say use in another field as well. That's going to be a distinction that's going to be relevant in terms of thinking about general interest versus field. Okay. Um, the other thing you want to think about in terms of where to submit is you want to think about who are the associate edit the editors and associate editors, right? So coming back to the comment I made earlier that um, sometimes editors are trying to promote a research agenda. Well, if they're trying to promote their research agenda, then, you know, if you, there's an editor who is in your research area, you want to send it to that journal, you might want to send it to that journal because they may, they may have a stake in promoting that agenda. But also things like, you know, are they even going to just be sympathetic to the type of question you're asking? Are they going to know who are the right referees? Or are they going to send it to, you know, you know, you're a labor economist asking a particular type of question, and maybe, you know, maybe you're doing structural labor, and they go and send it to reduced form labor people, and that might not be the right fit for you, right? Um, and also, that you want to think about these questions a little bit earlier in the process, because it might influence how you write your paper. So when I think about submitting to a general interest journal versus a field journal, 
sometimes I write my paper slightly differently um, in the sense of when I'm sending it to a general interest journal, I want to make clear why this belongs in a general interest journal. Whereas when I want to go to a top field journal like Chet, I would say to myself, well, I want to get to the theoretical contribution as quickly as possible because that's what's going to excite the reader there. Um, when you're ready to submit, you just have the paper. You don't really need a cover letter. At each A, you get to recommend a managing editor. Um, I would recommend that you choose the managing editor that you think would be a good fit. I will say there is no guarantee that you're going to get that person, but try to get it. Um, if you think there's someone who's a better fit, let the let the editor in chief know that. Okay. Um, once the editor in chief, once you submit it, the editor in chief is going to assign a managing editor, taking a bunch of things into consideration. And then the managing editor is going to decide whether to desk reject the paper or send it to referees. Okay. Now, desk rejection is really the modal outcome that happens at EJ. I said this before, it's most, most of, sorry, more than half of the papers get desk rejected. And typically the desk rejection is happening because the managing editor thinks that it's not suitable for a general interest journal, but would be more suitable for a field journal. So I think it's maybe not going to talk to several fields, but really just scholars within that literature are really going to like it. Um, sometimes managing editors will consult a potential referee on whether or not they agree with this and things like that. But, but typically, the managing editor makes this um, decision on their own. And here, I want to come back to the writing of the introduction being super important, because the managing editor is clearly not going to read the whole paper to make that decision, they'll read the introduction. Um, now, admittedly, there have been times where the introduction has left me a little unclear and I went further into the paper to try to understand and then made a decision. But really, the introduction is what convinces the managing editor on whether or not um, to go further. Now, um, you know, um, so, so once it goes out to referees, um, the managing editors is going to pick referees based on either you know people they know in the field or they'll either lean on associate editors or um or experts in the field or colleagues and ask you know who who would be a good referee for something like this um google scholar i i tend to look at citations and then use google scholar that helps a bit um one thing i also always try to do is I, I try because it's a general interest journal at each a I try to um, I try to to make sure I don't have too narrow a set of, of referees so sometimes I'll ask somebody who's like you know maybe it's a theory paper I'll ask a theorist who's not exactly in that you know specific part of theory you know sometimes people come back to me and say but I'm not an expert and my point is yes I wanted somebody who's not an expert too to tell me if this is a general interest paper or not okay uh, I'll say that that's slightly different than a field journal like Chet at Chet I just you know want the experts only really okay um how many referees do you get that sort of depends on the editors um some editors like a lot of you know there's some editors who regularly go for four to six referees my personal one is i go for between two and four referees depending on how well i know the area of the paper and how well i know the referees so if i know okay these are two reliable referees who always write great reports i'm i don't want to use overly use referee re um, resources so i might just rely on those two whereas if it's an area i don't really know and i don't really know these referees i might go and try to get four referee reports just so that um so that i know um i'll get you know i'll be able to give some high quality feedback at the end of the day um so referees let me um in the interest of time i'm going to go a little bit quicker through this so that we can get to questions but let me just highlight a couple of things referees are just trying to do their best for the most part i don't want to pretend there's no bad referee out there of course there is uh, but there are a lot of referees who are just working hard to try to understand your paper. And obviously, they haven't thought about the paper as much as you have. Um, and they're not going to sit around and, 
you know, spend a week trying to understand a bunch of missing steps in your paper, right? So they're, right, they have a limited time too. They're trying to do the best job that they can, you know, given their constraints. So making your paper seem overly hard or making things sound like they're magical results that came out of nowhere is not going to be helpful to the referee. Also, writing the paper not clearly is not going to be helpful to the referee. What you want to do is you want to like give do everything you can to make the referee's job easier. Okay. Um, I have a couple of slides on how to write referee reports, which I'll skip over unless there are some questions on this later on. Um, let me talk, talk a little bit about um, the what happens when you get a decision. Um, so um, most of the decisions are going to happen within two to three months. Um, you know, we wait for, sorry, most of the reports arrive within two to three months, and then it takes some time to process, right? You know, if I get six, you know, papers, um, six, six reports on six papers come in um, at the in the same week, which sometimes happens, right? Obviously, I'm not going to be able to do all six of them that week because I need, I, there's a lot to read there, right? And to digest. Um, I try to do it in a way where, I, you know, if there's one paper that I can see is going to take me two weeks to understand, I don't want to hold up some other papers, but I try to do it roughly in order. Um, now, when you get an outcome, the outcome could be reject, it could be revise and resubmit, it could be conditionally accept. Conditionally accept never really happens. Um, it's like winning the lottery. Um, so if it happens, then do everything that's asked. Let me go on to, to, to the more difficult ones. Um, so revise and resubmit. So first, get a revise and resubmit. You should go celebrate, like go get your favorite cookie or something, um, or you know, a beer or whatever makes you celebrate. You've got a foot in the door. And now you want to use your foot in the door to turn it into a publication. Okay. Now, typically editors are going to try to give advice on what must be done. Um, and you want to take all of the advice very seriously. So unless the editor says, ignore this in report X, you shouldn't ignore it. If you disagree with a comment or a suggestion, you should ask yourself why. So one possibility is I disagree with it because I really love the paragraph that I wrote. And so I want to be attached to it. In that world, just get over it. Do whatever they, they want and make them happy. Uh, another possibility is the referee misunderstood something factual. Obviously, you know, if the referee said you should say not X when X is true, you can't do that. So there you got to like ask yourself, okay, what in the writing caused the referee to think that? I'm going to change that part of the writing. And then in my reply to referees, I'm going to explain to the referee why that was wrong. And I'm going to do that in a polite way. Okay. The point is, don't ignore any of these comments. Um, let me, um, um, in the interest of, of time, let me just say one more thing here, um, which is, um, so you want to show you did everything. Let me add, sometimes people say, say okay, there's a, the, the referee wanted me to point out, you know, you know, this one thing here and this one thing here in the introduction, this other thing here. And so I'm going to like strip those sentences into like existing paragraphs. And then that ends up hurting readability. So just don't be afraid to say, you know what, I'm going to chuck this whole section and I'm going to rewrite it from scratch. Sometimes that's going to be both easier and clearer to do um, at the end of the day, even if upfront it seems inundating. Okay, now how to deal with a rejection. So first of all is, I'm sorry. Second, you're in good company. Everyone gets rejections. I get rejections all the time. That's what I expect to get. Um, you know, it's when I submit, I say for sure it's going to be rejected because 99 percent, well, not 99, but oftentimes it's rejected. Um, Everyone gets rejected. Okay. So what you should not do is you should not say, I got rejected. Let me five minutes later submit it to another journal. You don't want to do that because almost certainly you're going to hear the same, a subset of the comments you heard at the first journal, you'll hear them at the second journal. And you might even have the same referees, but even if you don't have the same referees, still those comments might appear again. And I've seen both versions where I've had the same referees and I didn't have the same referees and I heard the same comments. 
So what you want to do is you want to think of it as I am doing a revision just like I had a revise and resubmit, only now I don't get to explain to the referees in a cover letter things. I have to fix all the issues within the paper. Um, so, um, so you want to really think about absorbing this you, you know, if there's something that you genuinely think is an oddball and you'll never hear again, of course you can ignore that. But, you know, don't start out assuming that that's the case. Um, I saw, you know, various previous editors had comments about, oh, you shouldn't wait forever to do this. You should do this like right now. And I, I, I'll say here, I disagree a little bit. I think you, you got to do whatever works for your mental health here. And over time, what's worked for my mental health has changed depending on what mood I'm in. Um, so sometimes I get a rejection and I'm like so infuriated that I'm like, I need to show you that I can make all these changes within the next two weeks. And I do for the next two weeks, I stay up all night and I make a bazillion changes and the paper is completely different. Maybe it's not two weeks, maybe it ends up being a month. But, but it gets done and I have to do it super quickly just to prove a point to the referees. And sometimes my mental health is in a place where I'm like, I need some Zen. And so in those cases, I need to put the, the, the referee reports down so that I'm not super pissed at them and, you know, take some break and then go back in a couple of weeks and start thinking about how to do the revision. So do what's good for your mental health here. But don't let a couple of weeks turn into forever, because that's where the problems happen. And if you find yourself having it turn into forever, then you should talk to some friends and get some advice, because that's, you know, that's something that's going to be a problem, not just for this paper, but the next paper and the paper after that. Okay, so I took more than 30 minutes and didn't answer questions, but I'm happy to answer questions now. Okay, thank you, Amanda. Uh, I have a few questions, but uh, yeah. since I'm the chair first, I will wait and let's see if anybody has uh, anything. Otherwise, I'll, I'll start going. So, okay, Manuel, let's see a raised yeah. hand. Yeah, can I go on? Go ahead now. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Amanda, for um, um, the explanation and the insights. Um, my question is regarding uh, what counts for this journal, particularly. I would um, be happy if you would kindly um, give more details about the word counts. I know it's it's on the author's guide, but sometimes most of the journals um, I go through, they give a particular word count range. So my question basically is, um is there uh, a threshold uh, of which you can go above the wall count on secondly because most of the journals i've checked sometimes they do not they include references they include um diagrams figures some even interactive figures um for now but they do not include um, appendixes. So you're kind of confused whether to include the appendixes as, as a word count mm -hmm. or something. So it's, it's quite confusing sometimes because I've sent a paper to a journal and within a few days, I, I got a rejection based on word counts. And because, because um, my appendix, I, I thought, my appendix um, was excluded from the word count section only to realize that it, it was included. So I had to um, um, re, re, um, size the, uh, the, the, the paper and then sent it back before it was even considered for review. So what's your insight about word counts, the threshold of which you can go above the word count and then appendixes um, when it comes to word count in submitting in journals. Yeah. So, um, so first of all, is I should say that to the best of my knowledge, um, the economic journal doesn't have a maximum number of pages or a word count threshold. Um, I think the 
the issue is um, is one of readability. So I recently handled a paper that, you know, ex post I realized was um, submitted as a hundred page paper, and I'm like, dude, I like your paper, but we're not gonna, you know, um, we're not gonna have um, publish a hundred page paper here, um, you know. So the person is gonna revise it and. Um, it's not rejected based on that, but um, but the point is um, that at EJ, that's not an issue. It is an issue at other journals, and different journals, as you pointed out, have their own, um, you know, specifics. Um, I think, you know, personally, I think Econometricas is a little bit difficult right now because it's um, a very hard 40 pages um, with very specific typesetting, and as you said, so it's not a word count, but it's it's a page count, and um, and and certain, and it has to be typeset in very specific ways and things like that. I don't know every journal, so I can't you know make a comment on that. I think a lot of these policies have been put in place as and and certainly I've spoken to editors at Econometrica about this you know offline, where I th I think some of these policies have been put in place to prevent referees from coming back and saying, um, add in 15 extensions. And some of the policies are put in place to force authors to, to think about issues about readability. Um, but obviously there's a trade-off because sometimes like adding an extra couple of sentences is gonna be very helpful, right? So, you know, what a lot of people end up doing when you have these word count issues or the page number issue, page count issues, is they start saying, well, let me take out steps in a proof. Let me not tell you how I, you know, how I specified this particular thing, right? So they take out important steps that referees might skip over, but anyone who wants to truly understand the paper now has a difficult, a more difficult time with readability. So these things exist, unfortunately. Fortunately, I think, you know, we don't have it at EJ, um, some specific hard deadline here, um, count here. Um, so that's the good news. Um, um, but, you know, the thing I would say is when you're submitting to EJ, you should think about the readability more so than specific um, page, page counts or word counts. Okay, are there other questions? Oh. Chima, is that, did I pronounce your name right? Yes, yes, that's correctly pronounced. Thank you. And then thank you for, for what you've discussed. Um, my question has to do with more generally, um, it relates to how much, if any, editing you think needs to go, assuming all that you've said is accounted for anyway, how much editing do you think needs to go into a paper that has been submitted um, as part of your thesis that one is aiming to submit for publication? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think a lot, actually. Um, so I'll say it in two ways. So first is when you think specifically of the job market paper, um, oftentimes the job market paper ends up being sort of a little bit overblown to sell it to an entire department. Um, and sometimes there are things that you really want to peer down before it goes to a journal. Um, and secondly is, um, you know, specific chapters in your thesis. Um, you know, different programs read theses more or less carefully. And I think maybe a little bit, it depends on how careful your advisors and your committee members have been reading things. Um, but Personally, like I rewrote my job market paper completely between when it was submitted for the dissertation versus sending it out to a journal, um, and it that was that was super important in my case. I can't tell you in every case. What I would say is, in a situation like this, I would talk to your advisor and say, "Hey, can you just give me advice? You think it's." It need, it's ready to be submitted or it needs some work. One way or another, I would for sure proofread it a couple of times because almost certainly there are typos and things like that. Um, but, um, but, but I would talk to your advisor and get advice on what they think. Um, I think Lior is next. 
Yes, uh, thank you for the, the presentation. Very interesting. A short question. It's regarding uh, if I have a paper that is a working paper and uh, I didn't publish it yet and I'm trying to publish it in a journal and I'm thinking about maybe just uh, disseminating it as a working paper. Now, the thing is, I don't know if it could have an impact on reviewers once they see, uh, obviously, they're going to search uh, the paper online and going to find me and then there's not exactly uh, a double blind kind of situation. So I don't know if how much of a, a would you recommend people in the beginning their career to actually do uh, publish a paper uh, to uh, disseminate the paper as a working paper, even though that could uh, have an impact on the review process. OK, so first of all, at each A and most economic journals, um, it's not a double blind review. So the author is known to the reviewers, but the reviewers are not known to the author. Um, and that's true at almost every economic journal. I know like there are some top political science journals that have um, blind reviews for um, and, and that that's a little bit different. Um, but one way or another, they're going to know who you are. I, I think personally, I would put it as a working paper out there. Um, and I do it for two reasons. One is that there's some chance that this is going to lead you to get feedback from people you might not have gotten feedback from, and that's going to be good. The second thing is that um, you want it out there because, like, no idea is, co you know, completely new. Despite, you know, I think all my ideas are completely new, right? And we all do, but, but no idea out there is 100% new. And there is some chance that somebody out there is working on something very similar. If your paper is not on a website somewhere, then they can come along and say they were first, even though you have had it for three years already. Um, so I would put my thing out on a website just to take credit for, for you know, claim a stake on, on this topic. Um, yeah. Is that okay? Uh, Jin Lin? Yes. yes, thank you. Yeah, hello, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a more specific questions about the reference, reference reports. So basically my friend and I, we also got some report that have some doubts over the, the identification strategy. And they say you might need to turn to other methods instead of focusing on IV and something like that. So usually for these cases, or someone was just point out your exclusion restriction are wrong. And then, so in these cases, it's really hard to deal with this, at this referee reports. And could you please provide some suggestions about this hard to solve points? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so I think without knowing your specific paper, it's hard to address it, but I would say like, here's how I would personally think about it. Um, so sometimes, when I face the theory version of what you're saying, right? Sometimes I'm like, well, I, I sort of see your point. Um, let me step back and see if there's some, some big change I can make to the paper. And, you know, and so, you know, in that case, in your case, that would be, is there a different identification strategy, right? Now, it might be that relative to the data you have and what you know and and the question you're trying to ask there really isn't such a, a different identification strategy and if you're really stuck on that but i i would take that step seriously i i wouldn't you know even if it's a lot of work if you care about the paper i would take it seriously because it's more likely to result in um in, in something in in good news for you um but if there's really nothing you know then what I would do is I would try to present the problems to the reader before the reader sees the problems. And then I would try to put it in context on, is there something they can still learn from what I'm doing that is going to be useful to them, right? So maybe this is not the perfect identification strategy, but let me tell you why you should, let me, let me be the one to tell, point that out to you and let me be the one to tell you why 
Nonetheless, you should be interested in my paper, even if the identification strategy is not perfect. And maybe that has something to do with pointing out to, to the reader about things that are missing in the literature or something like that. It's hard for me to know without knowing context. But, but if you could give that, that reason, then I think there's some readers out there who would maybe have an open mind here. Now, it might influence, you probably pro want in that case to go to a field journal instead of a general interest journal and maybe not a top five, right? If there's really a serious issue, but, um, but, um, but, but that's, I think, how I would um, deal with this. But, you know, I have to really see the specifics to know. Um, Thank you very much. Gabriel? Yeah, so I want to reconnect to one of the first things that you said. So essentially the fact that uh, there are people out there with um, a different opinion about editing and uh, you know, publishing and so on. In particular, I wanted to ask you about what do you think is the role of an editor? Like we know that out there, there are some editors who just, you know, take the paper, see the referee reports, and then decide uh, in or out. Other, other editors were really active and say, okay, I'm going to publish it, but you need to do this, this, and this to, you know, mm -hmm. so that uh, I like it. So what's your opinion on this? And what do you think, you know, type of oh. editor's arrow should be? Um, so I, I personally, okay, so... I think that there's a certain sense in which editors are there to, there's a, a certain service component, right? In, um, in the sense of it can't, it shouldn't just be that I'm promoting my research agenda, right? I shouldn't just be pu publishing only papers in epistemic game theory. That, that just seems wrong to me. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, one of the reasons that I do this is maybe I don't want to promote a specific agenda, but I want to promote how people think about doing research at a broader level. Um, and so, you know, that influences, for instance, things like the fact that I um, do give feedback to authors above and beyond. Like, as you point out, there's some editors who just say, I counted the number of rejections and the number of um, revise and resubmits, and this is your answer, and go do what you want to do. Um, um, I, I think I'm not entirely certain why those people um, accept an editorial job, to be honest. Um, they exist, but I, I don't know why, um, in the sense that it's, you know, ultimately, I feel like I, you know, editors have to have to sift through it. And if you have three referee reports who are coming back saying rejection and they're all really stupid, you can't make that decision based on, you know, based on those three reports, right? Maybe, maybe it's the right call for a different reason. Maybe it's the wrong call. Like, I, I don't know. I just have a feel, a, a, in my view, it, there's a bit of the buck stops here um, mentality of I'm going to make I know I'm going to make mistakes. I know I have made mistakes, but I should be willing to take responsibility for my mistakes at some level. Um, there are definitely editors that just sort of pass along um, reports. I don't know what they're maximizing, to be honest. Um, there are editors who are for sure, you know, trying to promote their own their own research agenda, and I don't want to pretend that those don't exist. It's not that they are negative to other research agendas, but they are, um, they allow into the journals, you know, slight, they lower the bar for their research agenda. And I, I, I can't remember who, but I, there are a bunch of like articles out there of different editors, you know, um, saying their own experience. But before I ever had, you know, was an associate editor anywhere, I read one of those articles where the person commented that, he thought that that editors who were promoting their own research agendas weren't like creating a good journal. And it really struck me. And so, you know, that's something in my head, but but others do that. Um, what else is out there? I don't know what's in people's minds. <laughs> Sorry. That was a rambling answer that got you nowhere. <laughs> No, but it seems interesting to know that there are, you know, different type of editors and, you know, 
what they are thinking when they look at the papers and you know into the yeah. the publication process. Okay, I think we have time for one last question, and then I see that Veronica is online. Okay, so I guess I'll ask the last question. So, what do you think makes the difference between a reviewer submit and a, and a reject? That's a good question. Um, there are definitely a bunch of cases where I am on the fence for a long time um, on where where it goes. Um, I think that if there's a clear view of um, of if you do X, Y, and Z, then it will be a publication in this journal. At that point, I'm happy to allow the re the re um, the author the chance to do X, Y, and Z. Now, sometimes the X, Y, and Z are big to the point that it's almost a new paper. Um, and in that case, um, you know, sometimes I'll end up giving a reject and resubmit, and sometimes I'll do a revise and resubmit. And, you know, and, and to be honest, I think that, that which, you know, whether it turns out a reject and resubmit or a revise and resubmit, I think I, I could probably flip a coin in that case. I think it probably is about fine details of what I think the authors are going to be willing to do. If I think the authors might be willing to undertake this big revision, then I'll do the revise. And if I think that they might not, I would do the reject and resubmit. Um, but I think even the reject and resubmit, you have your foot in the door still. And I think that's really always the key. If you have your foot in the door, then it's your decision whether or not you want to do a big, a big, revision or not. Um, now, there are cases where I think like, hey, this is a super interesting thing, but it would need a big revision and I can't give you details um, on do X, Y, and Z. And when I can't give you those details, that's where I typically go for the reject because um, because you know, I, I don't want to I don't want to go through, you know, five rounds where authors continuously do bi make big revisions and they're not coming up to to the level I require. So I view when I give a revise and resubmit, I really view it as almost a contract. It's not to say a contract can't be broken, but it would take a lot for me to break it, and um, and it's. You know, and and if I can't give you that contract, I'm afraid of wasting your time as an author, of um, of going through um, through that process. So that's I think the margin that I really think about when I'm thinking about these marginal cases. 